and the wrong plan for seniors. I urge my colleagues to support the budget presented by the Congressional Black Caucus and to vote no on the proposed Republican budget. I yield back. Thank you, Congresswoman Fudge, and thank you for your strong defense of programs for children, for our seniors, and for families across this country. I'd now like to yield such time as he might consume to Congressman Danny Davis, a uh, strong fighter for health equity, for justice in our criminal justice system, and a valued member of the Ways and Means Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I want to thank the gentle lady from the Virgin Islands for her leadership in convening and anchoring these sessions that we hold each week. I also want to commend and pay tribute to Representative Bobby Scott for the tremendous leadership and work that he provides each year, helping the Congressional Black Caucus analyze, synthesize, and look seriously at how we move forward as we prepare a budget. As has already been indicated, budgets are indications of priorities. What is it that you're really hoping to do? What do you really hope to accomplish? And so this budget I view as a tremendously positive alternative to any other budgets that we have seen, that I have seen at this time. So I rise in strong support of the Congressional Black Caucus's FY 2013 alternative budget. February's job report reveals three months of strong jobs growth in America. And while there is a sigh of relief for millions of consumers and the unemployed, moving from the sidelines in search of work with hopes that their prospects will improve, there is little change for the 5.4 million long-term unemployed, 8.1 million involuntary part-time workers, and marginally attached individuals no longer in the labor force who wanted and were available for work and looked for a job at some point during the last 12 months. And so it becomes obvious that any budget should have at its core job creation opportunities so that people can experience this opportunity or this commodity that we call work. Appearances of an economy poised for growth does little for underserved minorities residing in disinvested communities blighted with high rates of joblessness, poor perform performing schools, poverty, and crime. Indeed, promise of a new day and new hopes are few and far between for poor, low-income workers generally and returning citizens with barriers to employment in particular. Indeed, over the past decade, the poor in America have gotten poorer. And of course, the wealthy have gotten wealthier. And those who are called middle class have been squeezed to the point where they are teetering and certainly could go in either direction. That is, up with the right kinds of opportunities and down with the wrong kind of opportunities. I don't believe that we can afford in good conscience to continue to turn a blind eye to census figures and monthly data reports of the economic injustices and suffering being imposed upon a growing number of people. Moreover, we cannot continue to hold the great nation hostage for the sake of a few while millions suffer. If we're truly going to address the crisis in America and put all Americans back to work and reduce poverty, we must create a mixture of universal 
and targeted programs capable of weathering political obstacles. The Congressional Black Caucus alternative budget is a means to this end. Indeed, the CBC budget safeguards investment in public education, Pell grants and transportation vital to equipping minority youth and adults with skill sets so that they can obtain and maintain access to gainful, sustainable employment in our ever-changing global economy. By renovating and building new schools and investing an additional $50 billion in transportation and infrastructure in 2013 and $155 billion above the President's budget over the next decade, repairing not only and building bridges across lakes, rivers, and streams, but also bridges to opportunity. The Congressional Black Caucus budget protects the health care safety net programs that have been developed. It also protects second chance funding while restoring funding to Department of Justice programs for citizens who are returning home from jail and prison with serious barriers to employment. We hold these truths to be self-evident that if America is to become the America that has never been, but the America that all of us hope for and know that it can be, then we would take the principles encased in the Congressional Black Budget and comply those to whatever budgets are ultimately passed. So again, I want to commend Mr. Scott. I want to thank uh, Delegate uh, Christensen, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Congressman Davis. And I'd like to just say a few words about the Congressional Black Caucus budget and sub strong support of this budget. As I said, it's a responsible budget that is a statement of our values and priorities, and it, as the title says, it restores America's promise and invests in our future. Our budget, as Congressman Scott said, builds upon the President's budget. In it, we ensure that our children, our veterans, and seniors are protected and adequately taken care of. We invest in education and health care, as well as in research and innovation. It, our budget provides revenue by enacting tax measures that are fair, that close loopholes, and that protects tax cuts for hard-working middle-class families while protecting vital safety nets that help the poor and provides them with stepping stones out of poverty. Those safety nets that we protect, protect for in, are, for example, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, critical programs, the su Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families, TANF, and many, many others. And it does all of that while reducing the deficit by an additional $3.4 trillion compared to the President's budget. It's, our budget stands as a direct contrast to the Republican Ryan budget. The Ryan budget begins at the outset by breaking the hard-fought agreement on caps set in the Budget Control Act of 2011. If they can't keep their word on something that they forced an agreement on, then what will they keep their word on? So the Republican budget um, begins across the board cuts at 5.4% in 2013. They do not cut any defense spending as agreed to in the uh, Budget Control Act, but in 2014, they would reduce those caps 19% before below the agreed to caps in non-defense spending over 10 years. And I guess they know that the Supreme Court arguments made by those 26 states that began today against the Affordable Care Act are not going to win the day, that that court will up uphold the constitutionality of the law, and so the Republican budget would repeal the Affordable Care Act. Just to take a look at what Republicans take out of health care. They would cut funding for the Indian Health Service by 19% beginning in 2014. That would greatly diminish access to health care for the American Indians who already suffer disproportionately from many diseases and as a result have a very low life expectancy compared to the white population. In the Republican budget, there are cuts 
to funding to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which would make it very difficult for that agency to meet its responsibilities in overseeing these critical programs. There are also cuts to the Food and Drug Administration, which would reverse what Democrats were able to do to strengthen protections in food and medicines and put the Ameri those cutting back on those programs would put the American public at an increased risk. While in this difficult economic climate, the President's budget managed to fund NIH at its current level, the Republican Ryan budget would jeopardize new research by cutting that budget and that, that research that would lead to innovations in medicine and improved lives would be jeopardized. In addition, they cut WIC and turned SNAP into a block grant, which weakens their ability to help those who increasingly find themselves food in food insecurity as the gap between the rich and poor has widened and incomes have plummeted. And it cuts the Republicans' favorite target, the EPA, which would reduce our investments in public health and harm our ability to protect our public from air and water pollution and land contamination. On the other hand, our budget, the CBC budget, which is always a very responsible budget, responsible to the American people and fiscally responsible. While it provides more deficit reduction than the Republican Ryan budget, it still makes important investments that are critical to a strong future, including in health care. First of all, our budget upholds the Affordable Care Act and fully funds it, but it takes it one step further by creating a public health insurance option that by itself saves almost $103 billion in health care costs over the next decade. It adds $10 billion to health care funding in the 2013 budget, and that $10 billion more robustly funds the following important programs such as the AIDS drug assistance programs, which have been underfunded for years, causing states to drop persons from their roster with HIV and AIDS, or reducing the coverage, reducing the benefits, and causing increasingly long waiting lists. It also increase, increases funding for Ryan White, the Minority AIDS Initiative, and prevention activities for HIV, for STDs, for TB and hepatitis. Our budget funds the offices of minority health, which were expanded and strengthened under the Affordable Care Act to improve health equity. We expand and pay for oral health programs, for health care facilities improvements and construction. We, fund, we increase funding for the maternal and child health and the preventive health block grant. We fund the physician training scientist programs, which brings underrepresented minorities into uh, health care uh, careers, both in the practice of medicine as providers and in research. We provide additional funding for substance abuse and mental health services administration. And we finally provide adequate funding for the National Institute on Minority and Health Disparity at NIH. And we also restore funding for the REACH program, a very important program that assists racial and ethnic minority communities to develop programs and unique approaches to health care just uniquely for those communities. We fund many, many other health-related programs and services. And still, with all of that, we reduce that deficit by $3.4 trillion over the next 10 years. The health provisions, as well, those health provisions, as well as those in education, in research and innovation, in protection of the safety net programs and tax fairness, those in the CBC budget makes it one that is clearly a statement of our values and priorities, a statement of America's values, values that everyone in this body should support. And at this time, I'd like to yield again to such time as he might consume to our leader on budget in the CBC, Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank, thank you. Um, and I thank the gentlelady from the Virgin Islands for her very strong statement. Um, Mr. Speaker, we have tough choices to make. And when we start the discussion with how much uh, people will get in tax cuts, you know the rest of the discussion will not be serious. We have um, decided if you're going to have tax cuts, if you can extend them, they have to be paid for. That is a stark contrast between the CBC budget and the Republican budget. Now, when, Mr. Speaker, when people say we have to cut Medicare, they should look at the Republican budget because the only reason you have to cut Medicare 
is to fund the tax cuts. If you do not extend the tax cuts, you don't have to cut Medicare. When the same budget includes massive tax cuts and cuts in Medicare, it ought to, uh, so people ought to notice that if you don't have the tax cuts, you don't have to cut Medicare. Now, uh, the Republican budget has uh, virtually dismantles Medicare. Uh, it provides this, um, uh, and I, I don't, it's a voucher, but I think they like to call it what a premium support something or other. Uh, basically, you dismantle your right to Medicare, and you get uh, the, some money to go see if you can buy some insurance on the private market. Turns out that the amount of money you're given, I'll call it a voucher, is about will be about six thousand dollars short of what you need to get the equivalent of Medicare coverage. That's where the savings is. You, sh you don't reduce the cost of health care, you just shift it over to the seniors. Now, now one of the ways they uh, try to convince people to go along with it is they tell people who are paying attention, those over 55, they say, well, it's not going to apply to you. We will we'll continue to plan for about 10 years, and then we'll inflict this, uh, the, the, this scheme on everybody else. And, uh, and so people over 55 say, well, that's, that's good. I don't have to worry about it. Well, actually, people over 55 do have to worry about it because the people making the promise that you will be able to have a Cadillac uh, Medicare program when people coming behind have a little uh, motor scooter for, uh, for their health care, and you think people are going to pay taxes when they're going to get a motor scooter for your Cadillac plan, uh, I think the idea that they're going to continue paying those taxes are remote. And you have to notice that 10 years from now, when the uh, decision gets made to try to inflict the scheme on the younger people, the people who will be keeping the promise uh, for those over 55 aren't the ones that made the promise. They will be new representatives who don't have any commitment to keeping that promise. In fact, Election after election, some of the younger people might ask, well, uh, 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 you, um, are you going to continue taxing me to support a premium uh, a Medicare program when all I'm going to get is a voucher? I want to know which one of the candidates will either cancel the uh, Medicare for everybody and have everybody get this little voucher thing or continue the Medicare program for everybody. But if you, I want to know if anybody up there is going to tax me for, for a Medicare program that I'm not going to get. And after five election cycles, the people that survive that will be the ones uh, dealing with the promise that others, that others made. I doubt if any of them will be able to sustain that kind of pressure. When the time comes, either everybody will get this little voucher thing or everybody will get a Medicare card. And the idea that some will get a nice big Medicare package and everybody else coming behind get a little piece of voucher and think that's going to be sustained for any length of time, I think they got another thought coming. And so people ought to recognize that even those over 55 uh, have to protect Medicare. And the reason it's being cut is so that millionaires can get their tax cuts. If you let those millionaires' tax cuts expire, you don't have to uh, you don't have to cut Medicare. Now, as the gentlelady from uh, Virgin Islands said, we have a responsible budget. We name the cuts that are made. We name the taxes that will be affected, and you can see exactly what we're doing. Unfortunately, in the Republican budget, you get these unspecified cuts, 19 percent on average. Well, you know it's not going to be on average. It's not going to be across the board because some, some, some programs won't be cut. You're not going to cut the FBI by 19 percent. You're not going to cut federal prisons by 19 percent. So if you, all those that you remain that you don't cut, you end up having to double up to meet your number. You've got to double up on the next one. So we have no idea what's going to happen other than all of these kind of unspecified cuts. And hopefully everybody's thinking, well, that's not going to be my program. That's not the one I depend on, when in fact it not only might be 19 percent, it might be 20, 30, 40 percent cuts in those programs. The um, fact is that the Congressional Black Caucus is a responsible budget. 
and it comes in almost $800 billion better on the bottom line than the Republican budget, there will be the alternative. Uh, we have shown that you can be responsible, you can be compassionate, and you can be fiscally responsible, and that's the Congressional Black Caucus budget. Now yield back to the gentlelady from Virgin Islands. Well, thank you for uh, summarizing that for us and for pointing out the very important point that in order to it's in order to keep those tax cuts for the millionaires that those programs that so many people in this country, the poor and the middle class depend on, will be cut. And that's a trade off that we don't that this country should not be taking and we do not support. So we are very pleased to present our budget and uh, as I said and as Congressman Scott said, this is a very responsible budget that not only invests in the future and keeps uh, America's promise to its people, but it saves money, $3.4 trillion over t 10 years to reduce the deficit. So with that, we ask for the support of our colleagues and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady yields back the balance of her time. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the majority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise tonight uh, and join down here with many of my colleagues as freshman members of the U.S. House of Representatives to have an open and honest conversation with you, Mr. Speaker, and with uh, all of America to talk about an issue that I believe is timely with the court case that is now pending in the United States Supreme Court dealing with the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare, otherwise known as uh, many other items, but tonight we'll be referring to it as Obamacare or the Affair Affordable Care Act. To me, Mr. Speaker, it is clear that Obamacare is a legislative act that overpromises, overspends, and underperforms, all at the expense of hardworking taxpayers. The law does little to get to the root cause of the problem in health care, and that is escalating cost increases across America. To me, the law is more focused on health insurance reform and does not do much in regards to curving the increasing health care costs in America down. Now, in the House of Representatives, we have voted repeatedly to repeal this atrocious law. And I believe that is the best course of action for many reasons, and I'm sure we're going to get into those reasons tonight. But tonight, uh, we are joined by many freshman colleagues. And what I'd like to do at this point in time is yield to my good friend from Georgia, Mr. Scott, a great member of the freshman class and president of the freshman class, to offer some comments in regards to the same. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, as you know, this week the United States Supreme Court began hearing testimony on the constitutionality of the president's health care law a law that, according to a USA Today poll, 72 percent of Americans believe is unconstitutional. Mr. Speaker, the key question is, if the federal government can mandate its citizens by health insurance, then what can they not mandate from Washington, D.C. that the American citizens must buy? Mr. Speaker, the consequences of this mandate are severe. If the Supreme Court does not overturn it, what will the federal government allow themselves to mandate next? Life insurance? Just one word different health insurance versus life insurance. Bank accounts, a red car instead of a blue one, organic apples instead of grapes. President Obama has put America on a very steep and slippery slope, and House Republicans are here to stop him. During his takeover of one-sixth of the U.S. economy, and that's what it's about, Mr. Speaker, it's about the fact that this is one-sixth of the United States economy. President Obama stated that if you liked your plan, you can keep it. It was a promise, a pledge he made to the American citizens. However, Americans soon found out, as we know today, exactly what he meant. Under President Obama's health care law, you technically have a choice. Technically, you have a choice. You can keep your current plan, as he promised, the health insurance plan that you chose. And yes, as long as the President, via his commission of unelected bureaucrats, approve, approves your purchase, then you can keep the plan without paying a penalty. However, if his bureaucrats don't approve your plan, you'll pay a penalty. Mr. Speaker, the American people know that's not a choice. Now, two years after this bill was signed into law, our worst suspicions are now being confirmed. Thanks to President Obama and the Democrats who use their control of Congress, Americans will have higher costs and a reduced level of care. 
The nonpartisan CBO estimates that non-employer sponsored health insurance premiums will be 13 percent, 13 percent higher than if this legislation had not been signed into law, Mr. Speaker. Over 90 percent of seniors will lose the retiree prescription drug coverage they currently enjoy and also be hit with double-digit premium increases. The CBO has also noted that the health care law may, may hinder job creation. Now, Mr. Speaker, I believe there's no doubt this bill kills jobs. In, in fact, when you get right down to it, a small, a small business owner who has more than 50 employees is actually going to be encouraged to terminate the number of employees that they have above 50. Otherwise, they will be penalized if they do not comply with the law. Now think about that, Mr. Speaker. Not only does this law hinder job creation, but it forces employers to get to under the 50 employee threshold so that they will not have to deal with the job killing bureaucracy that this bill forces upon them. That's coming to Congress last January. The House Republican uh, Conference has voted to repeal not only this health care bill in its entirety, but the 1099 provision, which the President agreed with us on, the Class Act, which the President agreed with us on, and most recently, the IPAB rules. It's time for the Senate and President Obama to wake up and realize what the majority of Americans already know. The Not So Affordable Care Act is simply bad economic policy, bad health care policy, and a violation of our constitutional rights as American citizens. Well, I thank the gentleman from Georgia for uh, joining us this evening. And, and on the point about small businesses, I, I would refer uh, to a McKinsey Group report that found that more than one half of employers with high awareness of the impact of Obamacare said in the poll and in that report that they will stop offering health coverage when it becomes fully implemented as a result of their concern as to the bureaucratic pressure and the cost that this law is going to put on Small Business America. To me, that's unacceptable. I know it is unacceptable. Absolutely. My colleague from Georgia, and I so appreciate you entertaining some time with us tonight. And with this, I would like to yield to my good friend from South Carolina, a great member of the freshman class, Mr. Jeff Duncan. Well, I want to thank the gentleman from <clears throat> New York for his leadership on this issue. And um, I just got a text message a minute ago from my wife that said my youngest son, he's 11, hit an in-the-park home run. You know, I wasn't there. I wasn't there because we're here serving uh, in the United States Congress to try to make America better for my 11-year-old and for children and of this generation and future generations. And, and I believe that this particular legislation that was passed by the last Congress should be ruled unconstitutional. For a lot of different reasons, and I think my gentleman, uh, my good friend from Florida, Mr. West, is going to talk uh, momentarily about an article that he wrote, an, a great op-ed in, in a Washington newspaper today, and I thought it was spot on, so I don't want to steal his, his thunder on that, but he talks in there about the Independent Payment Advisory Board, this committee of 15 members that... Congress basically divested some of its power, gave some of its power over to a 15-member panel. Now, America needs to realize that this 15-member panel will be making decisions, health care decisions for you and your family. If you're on Medicare, this 15-member panel, IPAP, will be making decisions on what they will pay for, what treatments you can get, how long you can stay in a, a, a nursing facility for rehab, a lot of different things. We're divesting responsibility and decision-making to a panel. Now, this Congress, just last week, passed the repeal of that Independent Payment Advisory Board, IPAP as it's known. We sent it to the abyss known as the United States Senate because under that Democrat leadership, under Harry Reid, they failed to take good, common-sense legislation up in the Senate for a vote. But you know what? The last Congress that passed what's now known as Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, they gave some of their power away to this board. And anything that board does becomes law. And the only way Congress can overturn that law is with a majority vote or a supermajority vote in the United States Senate. That's 60 members that have to vote for something, vote against something that the IPAP does. So, and when I read the United States Constitution, in Article 1, Section 1, it's at the very beginning, right after the preamble, this is what it says. It says that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. I don't see in there an independent payment advisory board at all. I see a United States Congress made up of a House and a Senate. 
That's what the United States Supreme Court ought to rule automatically unconstitutional in this bill. We can talk about a lot of other things, but that bill was wrong for America. It's going to cost small businesses. It's going to stymie the economy. And we may never recover from what's coming with the full imp implementation of Obamacare. And uh, with that, I'll yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman's comments uh, so much because the Independent pay Payment Advisory Board is a classic example of what is wrong with Obamacare. What they did in Obamacare in the last congressional session was delegate its authority to 15 unelected bureaucrats. You're absolutely right. And the worst thing about it, to my colleagues and Mr. Speaker, the worst thing about it is that 15-member board is not subject to any open law requirements. They don't have to conduct their hearings in public. They don't have to conduct their deliberations with public input. It's 15 unelected bureaucrats that are making fundamental health care decisions that should be patient-centered relationships between a patient and a doctor, but yet under Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act, what this Congress did in the 111th Congress was delegate its authority to 15 bureaucrats to make those life and death decisions. Will the gentleman yield? I would definitely yield. That's an interesting point because you know, I'm on the Natural Resource Committee. We deal with uh, the EPA and, and um, a number of other, what used to be known as the MMS and now BOMER, that makes uh, regulations regarding offshore drilling. And they can't do anything without some public comment period. They can't promulgate a regulation that isn't subject to a public comment period and an appeal process. But from what I hear you saying is this 15-member board can pass something in the dark of the night, in the back room, without transparency, without public input, without a public comment period, and it will have the force of law. Now yield back. Well, I so appreciate that comment. And with that, at this point in time, I'd like to yield to a great colleague, Mr. Trey Gordy, uh, Gowdy from South Carolina. Mr. Gowdy has joined us this evening, and I, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this topic. Well, I thank the gentleman from New York, and I thank my colleague and friend from South Carolina, Mr. Duncan, my colleague, and friend from Georgia, Georgia, Mr. Scott, my colleague and friend from the great state of Florida, Colonel West, all of whom are experts, Mr. Speaker, on the policy of Obamacare. I want to talk to you some, about some other than policy. I want to talk to you about the law. But I'm going to concede up front, Mr. Speaker, that having health insurance is a wise idea. Having health insurance is a really, really good idea. Walking over from the, from, from the Longworth office building just a few minutes ago, Mr. Speaker, I passed two dozen people who were out jogging or otherwise exercising. And I can't help but conclude exercising is a wise idea. But Congress has not mandated exercise, not yet at least. The week's not over with yet, but so far we have not mandated exercise despite the fact that it is a good policy. And Mr. Speaker, I couldn't help and talking to my wife tonight to be reminded that remembering our spouses' birthdays is also a wise idea. So far, although the week is not over with yet, Congress has not mandated that we remember our spouses' anniversaries. So up front, let's acknowledge there's a difference between being a good idea and being a constitutional idea. Because, Mr. Speaker, what my question is, is for Colonel West from Florida, then I will ask initially rhetorically, and then I'd like him to answer it, is can Congress make you eat beets? Because beets are good for you, Mr. Speaker. You know that. You're a physician. What you eat matters. Can Congress make you eat okra? Can it make you eat cabbage? And if not, why not? If all we're here to talk about is whether or not something is a good idea, and there are no constitutional limits to what Congress can do, then my question is, why not? Why can't we just debate this on the basis of public policy? And the answer, Mr. Speaker, is this, because we have a Constitution which is the supreme law of the land. And the Constitution has specific enumerated powers of what Congress can and by absence cannot do. And the Commerce Clause says that Congress can regulate commerce among the several states. And that's what this administration will be arguing this week, that that one phrase, that Congress can regulate commerce among the several states, gives this body the power to force everyone to purchase a private product, that being health insurance. So my question to you, Mr. Speaker, is this. 
If health insurance is a good idea, how about life insurance? Because heaven knows we don't need any more generational debt in this country, Mr. Speaker. It is not fair to pass on debt to subsequent generations. So why don't we mandate, before this week is done, why don't we mandate life insurance? And I've seen study after study after study. The good oral health is tantamount to good overall health. So why don't we mandate before the week is over with, Mr. Speaker, mandate that everyone must purchase dental insurance? If not, why not? Mr. Speaker, as you know, I, I, I was a prosecutor in a former life. So I took great note of two Supreme Court cases, Lopez and Morrison. And Lopez, this body passed the Gun-Free School Zone Act, saying we don't want guns on junior high and high school campuses. And the Supreme Court of the United States said that may be a laudatory public policy position, but Congress has no business regulating the campus of high schools and junior high schools. And Mr. Speaker, Congress also, and this issue is very near and dear to my heart because I come from a state that has struggled mightily with the issue of domestic violence. We have struggled mightily with that. So Congress passed a Federalized Violence Against Women Act. In the United States versus Morrison, the Supreme Court said that is a very laudable public policy. But the Commerce Clause of the Constitution does not give you the power to tell the several states how to handle domestic violence, and they struck it down. So we've got to, in this country, somehow find a way to separate what is good public policy from what is the law of the land. Because, Mr. Speaker, I will tell you this. If the Supreme Court says that Congress can make you purchase a private product like health insurance, then I beg someone to tell me what are the limits to what that we can tell people to do. Can we make them exercise? We all know that's good for you. If I've got to subsidize the health of people who are obese or have hypertension, why can't I make them exercise? Because this is America, and Congress can't make you exercise. They can encourage you to do it, but they can't make you do it. And Congress can't make you buy dental insurance. And Congress can't make you buy life insurance. And Congress can't make you exercise or get out of the rain when there's lightning. There are lots of things that we ought to do that Congress can't make us do. And if the Supreme Court says that Congress can make you purchase life insurance, Mr. Speaker, that is the end of federalism in this country. There are no limits to what this body can make its citizens do if this law is upheld. And I thank the gentleman from New York, and I thank my other colleagues. Well, I thank the gentleman for uh, coming tonight and sharing the passion of what we're talking about. And we're talking about Obamacare and the constitutionality and the concepts of federalism. And it reminds me, Mr. Speaker, of over 200 years ago, our founding fathers had the brilliance, the vision, to recognize that the federal government is a limited federal government. The power of our government rests in the people, not in the federal government. The power of our government represents in the local and state entities that are closest to the people. I firmly believe in the Tenth Amendment and believe that the governments that are closest to the people are the best to be in the position to regulate and govern those people. We should respect the U.S. Constitution and the limited powers that are enumerated in here and recognize, and I, ho I hope that the United States Supreme Court joins me in that position and recognizing that there are limits to the federal government the Interstate Commerce Clause has limits, and it's not open-ended in order to force us to purchase health insurance for the sake of forcing us to engage in commerce in order to more effectively regulate interstate commerce. If I so agree with the gentleman from South Carolina. If that is the holding of the court, then the federal government has no bounds. The federal government will control every ounce, every corner, 
of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And with that, I'd like to yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. West, who I so enjoy being a colleague of here as a freshman member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Mr. West. And I want to thank my colleague from New York, Mr. Reed, and I want to thank my colleague from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, and the previous colleague, Mr. Duncan, my freshman class president, my uh, brother from Georgia, and also my colleague from the great state of Arkansas, Mr. Griffin. Mr. Speaker, very simply. The Supreme Court has begun to consider the legality of the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, also referred to as Obamacare. The High Court will pour over Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution to determine the meaning behind the words, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. The 2012 Supreme Court must now determine whether the founders had any intention of mandating the behavior of private enterprises and American citizens. To me, Mr. Speaker, the answer is obvious. Absolutely not. Our nation was founded on the Declaration of Independence. Freedom of choice and a free marker are at the core of our nation's soul. A governmental mandate for the behavior of individuals and private enterprises is anathema to what our founders intended. The prospect of having an unelected panel of bureaucrats determining fundamental decisions about our individual health is perhaps the most personal and intimate intrusion into our lives. This concept is absolutely absurd and dangerous law which surely ranks with the grievances laid down 236 years ago in the Declaration of Independence. Grievances such as he has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained and when so suspended he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has erected a multitude of new officers and offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, given his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws and altering fundamentally the forms of our governance. That's why, Mr. Speaker, each and every day I carry this Declaration of Independence and Constitution right here next to my heart. Because in January of 2011, Florida Federal District Judge C. Roger Vinson ruled the individual mandate unconstitutional, stating, never before has Congress required that everyone buy a product from a private company essentially for life just for being alive and residing in the United States. If the government has the power to compel an otherwise passive individual into a transaction, it is not hyperbolic to suggest that Congress could do almost anything it wanted, just as my colleague from South Carolina articulated so well. Today, this prediction is being attempted before our very eyes. With Obamacare, insurance companies will be forced even to provide contraceptive products free of charge. But, Mr. Speaker, why just contraception? Will the government next force insurance companies to provide surgical procedures free of charge? Where does it end? Perhaps supermarkets will be compelled to offer apples and carrots free of charge to ensure children have access to healthy food. Beyond exerting oppressive control over individuals and private enterprises, Obamacare circumvents the foundation of our own legislative structure. At the heart of the Affordable Care Act is the independent payment advisory board made up of 15 unelected officials appointed by the president to one simple purpose to reduce Medicare spending. The IPAB will be tasked with and given the authority to reduce costs to the government by and among other things limiting reimbursements to doctors. It doesn't take a brain surgeon Mr. Speaker to recognize that this will lead to more physicians leaving the Medicare system reducing access to care for our seniors and limiting available treatments. But this isn't the most frightening part. Any recommendations that the IPAP automatically brings forth becomes law. The only way around this unprecedented amount of power for Washington bureaucrats 
is an act of Congress with a three-fifths supermajority in the Senate. In other words, the unelected IPAB appointed by the President essentially becomes its own shadow legislative body. The fundamental structure of our government with three co-equal branches and a careful system of checks and balance is being usurped. Our freedoms and liberties are being chipped away bit by bit. Our country is being transformed step by step incrementally into a centrally planned, stringently controlled, bureaucratic nanny state. And what I find most frightening is that a portion of our populace willingly dons these shackles and like lemmings will march this great constitutional republic off to its own demise. Perhaps some Americans are simply unaware of the exorbitant monetary costs of this governmental behemoth. The numbers don't lie, Mr. Speaker, and they are dangerous. $1.76 trillion from the American taxpayers to pay for Obamacare over 10 years. Nearly double the $940 billion that was forecast when the bill was signed into law. As a previous speaker said, we have to pass the bill in order to find out what is in it. $52 billion in new taxes on businesses as employers are forced to provide health insurance. $47 billion hmm. in new taxes on drug companies and medical device makers. Costs that will surely be passed down to patients, particularly our senior citizens. Families earning more than $250,000 a year will see more taxes as Obamacare adds a new tax to investment income, including capital gains, dividends, rental income, and royalties. 16,000 new IRS agents, 159 new government agencies and bureaucracies, $575 billion of cuts to Medicare. Insurance premiums are expected to increase 1.9 percent to 2.3 percent in 2014 and up to 3.7 percent by 2023 because Obamacare adds a premium tax on health insurers offering full coverage. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act is unworkable and destined to fail. One need only look back a few years ago to the last big government program with the word affordable in it. Our colleague from the other side, Barney Frank, brought forth the Affordable Housing Act, and it, in less than a decade, managed to demolish the housing market, weaken financial institutions, and wipe out the net worth of millions of Americans. So what makes anyone, Mr. Speaker, think government intervention in health care will be successful? Obamacare is unconstitutional. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, it's anti-constitutional. It violates those great inalienable rights that Thomas Jefferson said does not come from man. It comes from our creator of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It violates our individual sovereignty. And most certainly, it is probably one of the most awful pieces of American policy. So, Mr. Speaker, I pray that after next week's Supreme Court's decision, or whenever it comes, that this Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act becomes the most short-lived piece of legislation in American history. Thank you so much, and I yield back. Well, I thank my uh, colleague from Florida, and I see my colleague from Georgia would like to uh, weigh in. I probably would uh, Gentlemen, yield. Gentlemen, yield. After listening to my colleague from Florida, I, I'm going to tell you, it just drives home the point that, that power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You're talking about a panel that will have control of roughly one-sixth of the United States economy. One-sixth. That means more power in Washington. And I'm going to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or, or an independent, the more power that rests in this house, the less <clears throat> liberty you have in your house. We're here standing up for your personal freedoms, your individual liberties. We're working to make sure that you've got a health care system that, that will continue to support you, your children. We have over 300 children and grandchildren uh, that we're the parents and grandparents of in the freshman class. And that generation is more important than the next election. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, thank you for sharing your time. Well, I thank the gentleman, the president <clears throat> of the freshman class, uh, for that input. And, and what I'd like to say and follow up to the gentleman from Florida, uh, you know, quoting the numbers, and the numbers are real. Just recently, the uh, CBO, Congressional Budget Office, the independent bean counter of Washington, D.C., 
said that Obamacare, the real price tag under Obamacare, will be upwards of $1.76 <coughs> trillion dollars over 10 years added to our spending in Washington, D.C. We're at $15.6 trillion dollars in the hole. And we're going to add another $1.76 trillion dollars of spending to that price tag, to that debt. It's not sustainable. We have to do better. And we in the House of Representatives on the Republican side do have proposals and solutions that will replace Obamacare and go a long way to turning that cost curve in our ever-increasing cost of health care in America. And what I would like to do is go beyond the numbers. I can tell you from first-hand experience, and I know a lot of my colleagues believe in this just as I do, when I go back to my district in upstate New York, I go out and I talk to people on the front line. And just recently, in the last month and a half, I went to a business just north of Hornell, New York, a small electronics company that's been struggling day after day, just trying to make ends meet, has about 40 employees, 48 employees in his operation. And as I'm meeting in his office, as I'm talking to him about the future of his business, he stated to me, you know, because of this law, the Affordable Care Act, and its 50 employee threshold for the additional bureaucracy and requirements and taxes and penalties that Washington, D.C. is putting on that business, if he goes over that 50 employee threshold, he told me to my face <clears throat> that he will keep his employee roles at 48 and not venture down the path of hiring two more individuals. Those are two more families that will be getting a paycheck and putting food on their table and having the private capital put their kids through college because of legislation coming out of Washington, D.C. Mr. Speaker, we can do better. We will do better. And November 2010, with my freshman colleagues, was the start of that better governance for all of America. And I'm proud to be part of this freshman class. And at this point in time, I would love to yield to a fellow colleague of the freshman class, Mr. Griffin from Arkansas. Thank you. I appreciate it. appreciate you putting this together. I'm happy to come over here to the floor of the House to talk about the unconstitutionality of Obamacare. But before I talk about the Constitution and Obamacare, I want to make really clear to folks who may be joining us tonight that all of us here believe that we need serious health care reform in the United States. We know that we need health care reform. There are many parts of our health care system that we need to reform so that it is more efficient and so that we can deal with the rising cost. We get that. <clears throat> what we don't need is the health care reform that we got. We are not against health care reform. We are against the type of health care reform that we were given with Obamacare, a government-centered costly, bureaucratic health care law. What I favor, and what I think a lot of my colleagues favor, is a patient-centered health care reform that focuses on innovation and reducing cost, allowing more competition across state lines for insurance companies so that they can drive the cost down. Look for ways to provide quality care to continue to provide quality care to Americans while reducing costs. So I just want to make that really clear. We understand the need for health care reform. We also understand the need to reform Medicare. We know that we must reform it to save it. The President's health care law, as we've heard some others refer to tonight, it doesn't save Medicare. It makes changes. It takes $500 billion out of Medicare. And he set up an independent board, as we've heard, that will decide where cuts should be made. Instead of reforming, instead of looking for inno ways to innovate, it just cuts and ultimately rations Medicare. That's what the President's plan does. We have a better alternative a patient-centered alternative. But we're here tonight to talk about the law that we have, the law that I and many of my colleagues voted to repeal. 
and that is what some call Obamacare, the President's health care law. And we first have to start out, and we're talking about the Constitution, and recognize that this Constitution sets limits on the power of government. If it does not set limits on the power of government, then what good is it? It's not worth the paper it's written on if it doesn't set limits on government. And that's exactly what it does. That's why we have a Constitution in the first place. The founders, the people that started this great country, they knew, they knew what government overreach could do. They knew what government power out of control could do. And so the founders were very specific in providing limitations on government in this document. And when enumerating the powers of Congress, the Constitution clearly presents the power to regulate as separate and distinct from the power to raise and create. Now let me, let me tell you a little more about what I'm talking about here. The issue of whether Obamacare is constitutional or not boils down to the Commerce Clause. The Commerce Clause of the Constitution that gives the federal government the ability to regulate commerce. When setting out the powers, the Constitution clearly talks about the power to regulate as separate and distinct from the power to raise and create. Congress, for example, was given the power to create money and then regulate it. Congress was given the power to raise an army and then the power to regulate it. But that's not the case with commerce. That's not the case with doing business. Congress was only given the power to regulate commerce, not raise it or create it. The power to raise or create it is not there. For money in the military, the power to regulate does not include the power to raise. Rather, it follows it. So the bottom line here is there's no power to create commerce, create business transactions where they don't exist. As the gentleman, one of the gentlemen that was here earlier said, where does it end? If the federal government can make you buy insurance, health insurance, can they make you eat your broccoli? Can they make my two-year-old and four-year-old eat the broccoli? I happen to love potato chips. They're probably not the best thing for me. Can you stop me from eating them? If I eat too many during a Razorback game, can the Congress of the United States, does it have the power to say, we got to cut down on the number of chips people are eating? I say no. Congress does not have the power to do that. But you know what? A lot of folks would say yes, using the same reasoning that they believe they can make you buy health insurance. And that's ultimately what this debate is about. Yes, it's about health care. It's about the unconstitutionality of Obamacare. But more broadly, it's about the federal government reaching into your life and telling you how to live it. Because the federal government thinks that it knows best. The federal government thinks it knows what you should eat, when you should eat it, what kind of insurance you ought to buy. Now, I can't speak for the founders, but I got to believe, having read this document and many others that were around the founding of this country, I got to believe that they would be outraged, outraged if they knew what was going on in their name. If they knew that the federal government was claiming to have the power to do the things that it claims it has the power to do.
So, Mr. Speaker, this is a critical week in our history because of the arguments that are going on at the Supreme Court and the decision that comes out of the Supreme Court on this issue will be monumental. I would say for me and the people that I represent in Arkansas that I talk with when I go home, we believe, we believe that this Constitution establishes a limited government. And no matter how you interpret it, no matter how you interpret it, you have to agree that it sets limits and the federal government cannot, cannot force you to do whatever it wants you to do. I yield back. Well, I thank the gentleman from Arkansas. At this point in time, I yield to the gentleman from Georgia. I, I just, I think the gentleman from Arkansas made made a made a wonderful point. That